Hi, everybody. This is Ron Hart of the Metal God from Judith Priest with Brandon, and you're listening to Appetite for Distortion. You know where you are. for distortion. Welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode 222. My name is Brando. What a show we have for you today. Coming up a little bit later on, uh, for Appetite for Discovery, our new music segment, we will be speaking with Detroit guitarist Sammy Bowler. He has a brand new album, actually his first album. He's a guitar virtuoso, uh, Kingdom of the Sun, and it's really good. Uh, he's he's a young guy. He's a young dude, and he was discovered I, I, by Joe Satriani. He won this big Joe uh, Satriani contest. We're going to talk to him about that. Uh, but first, I mean, you heard it at the beginning. We're joined today by the metal god himself, Rob Halford. My goodness. Or I guess you should say my god for the metal god. Uh, he has his autobiography. It is out. Confess. And, I mean, I, I haven't finished it yet. But, I mean, this guy has a story that you want to hear. I mean, it's not just about Jewish priests. It's his, his entire life. How about we, we ask him about it, though? Let's not waste any more time. Hey, Rob, how are you? Hello, Brandon. I'm doing good, my friend. Are you in New York? I am. I'm in Queens, New York. Oh, just when I miss the city, I can't wait to get back to New York, Manhattan, everywhere, Queens, and Brooklyn, I've got a lot of great memories. I'd like to come back to see everybody again. Yeah, well, I, I, I hope that someday you're able to, to travel again and uh, we'll be able to see you uh, here in New York with Judas Priest. I know, you know, you played Long Island. You played, uh, well, I guess you're, you're, are you still banned from Madison Square Garden? Oh, that's a good question. I don't really know. I think we'd have to give them to the Madison Square Garden manager, of course. But hello, hello, this is Madison Can I come back and play your beautiful venue, please? Thank you. That's your vibe. It would be great. It's that is an iconic venue. It is so rich it's in history, for music, and sports, and all of these other incredible events. Everybody wants to play Madison Square Garden, and please, if you have the opportunity to do that, it's all going to be done. So I don't know. I did go back there with um, with Ozzy, with my, and with a half of them, and I think uh, I'll run and make an error, so it will be amazing. I, I have been through the doors before, so. They didn't throw me out, <laughs> but I don't know about you. I'm sure if we did, there would be some clever person just for the hell of it to start, you know, throwing a deep question, and then that might have uh, a kind of a knock-on effect. But uh, anyway, the fact that we've actually played there is still a thrill. Right on. So obviously, there's so many things to talk to. You're talking about Mass Square Garden, the uh, the mecca, as we call it here in New York. So, but obviously, we're here to talk about your, your book. So I guess that parlays into it. What I guess what was most cathartic for you to talk about the Jewish priest, the the metal god stuff, or your childhood, your upbringing, your family, your parents? What was more of a relief for you for you to talk about? I think when I did the audio for the book, because uh, we talked about bringing in a voice actor to the audio, and, and I really felt that it was important for me to do it myself in my own voice, just to give it, um, you know, an honest kind of performance, and it was. When I finished doing the, the audio, um, it took about a week or so to do. That's when it really hit me, you know, at, at this extraordinary life that I've had and all of the ups and downs that we had in life as we live. Um, so there wasn't really a, a specific moment, and it was, it's, it's everything. That's why, you know, sitting with the and getting to put the book together, um, Sitting with him and been staring me from my earliest childhood memory from when I was about maybe four or five years of age up until um, this, this year, early, early this year, um, it, 
it's everything, everything. You know, it, it would it would it would kind of be very very difficult to pick on one specific moment. Um, so that's that's the best way to enjoy this, this stuff is to absorb every every meta memory. I really appreciate, because I'm about halfway through, how conversational it is. You know, you're telling your story, you know, just like you're talking, like we're in the room with you and you'll make side jokes, you'll make little notations at the bottom if, if it's something that we Americans don't understand. So I guess I'm curious, like, do, is that just you, like the way you're talking, or was there maybe another autobiography or another author that inspired you to write this way? If you, if you and I were sitting together, at your place or my place or, or Delhi or whatever. This is beer. This is the conversation that we're having. This is my voice. This is how I communicate. This is my personality and my character. And Ian did an extraordinarily incredible job to get that into words, to get that into put into print. It's incredibly difficult to do. And Ian's been doing this forever. He's a master of his realm for making this kind of book. And when I was reading the, the, the fan script, I couldn't believe it because it's there. If I'm, I'm, I'm reading it and it's obviously in my own head because when you read, you know, you hear a voice. And I thought he's nailing it, you know. He's, he's, getting, he's getting the truth, the true question and essence of who I am as a person onto the pages, you know. So, um, again, all all credit and, and, and gratitude to be and for getting that part of me to kind of come alive on the book as you read it. All right. Okay. Because I, again, I'm, I'm just, it's a very easy read. And, and that's what I, I like in autobiographies when you're not trying, when you're just being yourself, you're not trying to sound like Jules Verne or, or Shakespeare. You're just being yourself. One of the autobiographies I, I want to mention, because he, I guess, he, I think he's still a friend of yours because you've worked with him plenty. And that's Slash. So I'm, I'm curious if you can maybe talk about your relationship with, with Slash, if you wouldn't mind. Well, I, I don't know Slash incredibly well. I'd like to think that we're friends. We have a tremendous respect for each other as musicians. He's a phenomenal guitar player. Uh, he's a really great guy. Um, he's really, really cool and friendly and easy going. And so that, that's that's uh, that's a nice thing to have. So so many people that have had the had the good fortune and great to, to have a long life in rock and roll turn out to be that way. Which uh, might sound odd because you, you, you have everybody has a personality and you're looking from a point to a, to, to a musician on stage and you're wondering what are they like off stage, you know? And so many of us have, have this uh, accessible quality. I think it's important. So um, it's, a, it's a, a friend, and um, and there you go. You know, uh, it, he's, uh, he's someone that uh, that I have a lot of uh, respect for and I admire the great work that he does. Right on. Because if you didn't notice the the name of the podcast is Appetite for Distortion. So rather than just being a rock talk podcast, that's kind of like you know I use the six degrees of separation, six degrees of Kevin Bacon into a, with GNR, see how it fits. And I got this um, this question. I'm not sure if you addressed it in, in the book. Uh, this is from Nicholas uh, Florentine because you shared a bill with Slash and and uh, in, Ac- in Guns N' Roses and Rock and Rio Two back in 1991. And now there's a rumor. There was a rumor, maybe a small controversy, if you want to call it that, that Axel didn't allow you to enter the stage with your your motorcycle. Is that true, or is this person is is Nicholas just making that up? Well. It's one of these kind of urban legend myths that I, I do remember vividly on the day that, that I was told that I wasn't able to use the bike. And I said, well, who's saying that? You know, and I said, it's Axel. And I said, well, that's pretty, you know, man, if, if, if that's true, that, 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 that's not what the role, you know. As the day was progressing, uh, and we were trying to figure out, you know, what was going to happen, because the bike has always been part of a, of a, of a cruise show. Um, the word got back that yeah, it's um, it's called beauty as a bike, and then a little bit further along, I found out that that Axel had never said, "Hey, you can't, Rob can't use the bike." It's come through some other channel, mm. and you know, never quite figured out the, the, the truth of that. I've never met Axel in my life. I would like to, and I'm sure I will at some point, because again, he's someone that 
a tremendous admiration and respect for as a, as a great singer songwriter, so uh, incredibly powerful, trans- charismatic frontman. And um, so there you go. It, it, it's not an all it's full of the, the kind of uh, almost good fake story, but um, at the end, at the end of the, the, the story is that of course I did use the bike, and we had a great, great show at Rock in Rio. Um, with guns and roses, and, and that's become kind of a bit of rock and roll history right there. See, that's fascinating, and that's exactly why we need your point of view, why you need to confess to set the record straight for so many of di- these different stories. And then that's just one of these rock and roll stories that gets twisted that perhaps didn't come from the source. So that that's 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 fascinating. Um, I, I know I don't have you here forever, uh, so I, this is just another question from uh, another listener obviously everyone's here excited to hear from you uh, this is from gilbert from your neck of the woods the uk so of everything that you've accomplished and this may be very hard of everything you've accomplished what do you want to be known for a hundred year, years from now like when they remember rob halford is there like what do you want your legacy to be wow that's, that's quite a profound question isn't it um, yeah. um I mean, I, I, I just condense it all down to the work that I've done with Priest, the metal that I've made. That, that, that's the great thing about music. It lives a lot longer than you do, on the side of life. There's another side, believe you me. But, um, yeah, I, I think that just the body of work, that, that I've had the, the great love and, and satisfaction uh, of, of creating for almost 50 years or so with, with Judas Priest, from that very first album, Rock and Roll, at this point in time where we're at now, with uh, with Firepower. So that's it for me. The music, the music is a legacy. Well, that's that's brilliant. And I, I know, obviously, to your fans, your music is the legacy, but what you've done for uh, for gay rights, just for for you, just what you how you've defined the genre, there's a lot of things that your legacy will be uh, known for, and that's coming from just one of your millions of fans. So... Uh, Rob, I can't thank you enough. I can't wait to finish your, your book, Confess, and I hope we get to do this again. It's been a pleasure, Brandon. Thank you, everybody that's been listening to uh, me and Brandon talk today. Uh, everybody, please keep safe and sound, and uh, we can't wait to be together once again, especially in the live shows that we miss so desperately. We love our fans, all of, all of the bands that are waiting you know, frantically to get back out on the road, and we will. We'll see each other again when it's safe for us all to do so. So it's been a pleasure, Brandon. Thank you for everything for the contest. And uh, we'll see you when I get back to you across the world. Brilliant, Rob. I thank you so much. I hope you're happy and healthy and just, you know, continued being uh, the metal god. Thank you so much. Until next time. Thank you, Brandon. Really, really enjoyed the interview. Thanks for the kind words. Bye-bye now. Ah, wow. I mean, we, we had the metal god on the appetite for distortion. And again, I say this all too often, but I can't say it enough. I would not have the platform to talk to Rob Halford if it wasn't for you listening. So just, just thank you, and you know, we'll we'll, we'll see, uh, we'll we'll get him on again, uh, I'm sure, in the future. Uh, but now, I mean, another uh, very cool thing I get to do here on the podcast, and that's discover new people, and we do that with a segment we like to call Appetite for Discovery. I just want to bury appetite rather than just throwing a bunch of songs together that we think are fun. We're going over it, you know, with a fine tooth comb and just working on everything to try. That's the goal. Bury appetite. Four. Discovery. So today we're going to discover Sammy Bowler, guitarist from Detroit. Uh, He's a new album out, Kingdom of the Sun via Candy Rat Records. Hey, Sammy, how are you? I'm all right, Brandon. Thanks for having me on, man. You're kind of like, I don't want to say new on the scene, because you've been playing guitar since, uh, what, you were 14, I read? Like, how long have you, or even younger, how long have you been playing guitar? I started playing when I was 11, man. Okay. Um, yeah, so over half my life, which is a little bit scary now. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've been playing for a long time, and I kind of, uh, I was kind of born into a musical family, like both my parents play and stuff. So uh, I feel like I've been playing forever, but, yeah, I started playing guitar when I was 11. So, because you're from uh, Michigan, you're from Detroit, so, I mean, that's a very musical city. There's a lot of different influences. So, I guess, how did your, I guess your parents influence you? I mean, because you're not, you're, you're not in Motown, you're, you're playing some, uh, some heavy riffs. 
So I, I guess how did they influence you, and how did what inspired? I guess at eleven years old to pick up the guitar, if you can remember. Um. Yeah, man. I've definitely always been more of a rocker. Like, uh, I think what really got me into playing was uh, uh, my dad gave me a Van Halen album when I was like even younger than that, like ten, and that's what made me really want to start playing guitar because. Up until that point, like they put me in piano lessons when I was really young, you know, like seven years old or something like that, seven or eight. And then, uh, but I was always, I always kind of just wanted to play guitar. I don't know for as long as I can remember. But, uh, yeah, I remember seeing, um, uh, I remember getting that first Van Halen album. And then, uh, I think on VH1 Classic or something at the time, I saw the video for Crazy Train, mm. uh, Ozzy and Randy Rhodes. And that kind of like sent me in a whole new direction, too. So, yeah, those, that was kind of like the beginning beginning for me, for sure. I love it. And so I'm just trying to do the math in my head because you said uh, like 11, like half your age. So you're in your early 20s, mid 20s. How, how old are you exactly? Uh, I'm 27. Okay. So, okay. Um, yeah. I got 10 years on Yeah, you. I'm still in my 20s, man. I, yeah, yeah, a little bit. But uh, time just goes quick, man. Every uh, It seems like every year is going faster and faster. It's a little bit scary, but uh, it's all good. So you were, I guess if you're 27 now, now I'm going to do my math. Okay. So if you're 27 now, 2002, I mean, excuse me, 2012. Uh, so that's eight years. So you were, my math is correct. Uh, 19? No, it's not. 18. How are you old were you? See, I can't do, I can't do this. I haven't done math in so long. This is why I'm in radio. Uh, that, that's oh, when you were on that, that, <laughs> that Master Satriani competition. How old were you then? Because that's a pretty big deal to to you know, to be at a young age, to be in your, uh, you know, early, you know, late teens, early twenties, to be surrounded, you know, be judged, I guess, by Joe himself. Um, yeah, I was always a huge uh, Tatriani fan too, but I was 19 uh, when I got to meet him. Uh, I answered this, uh, some of my buddies like recommended I answered this like uh, guitar center contest. And it's uh, like you mentioned, it's called Master Tatriani. And uh, I did a cover of Satch Boogie, which is like one of his uh, biggest songs, obviously. Um, and uh, I ended up like I ended up like winning a trip out to LA to meet him, and he did like this master class, and it was really cool, man. Like I had never uh, I'd never seen like one of my heroes up close before, you know. And especially like at nineteen, that's pretty young, you know. It's like first time in LA and all that too. So uh, yeah, it was re- it was really really cool, man. It's definitely a uh, experience I never forgotten. I won't forget, you know. Did you expect that, or you just like you said, your friends like, hey, you should try out for this? Did you ever expect to to win? Joe, Joe himself selected you to, to win his competition. Did you, you know, what expectations did you have for yourself at that time? Oh, no, not at all, man. I was like, I was in college, you know. <laughs> um, no, I never thought I'd, I could win or something like that. But, uh, no, it was like, it was just a, a really, I was honored, you know. It was, a, it was a really big surprise and a big honor, you know. And, uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was really, really cool. And I met some really nice people out there, too, uh, during that trip. Because there were, there were a few different winners, you know. And, uh, yeah, it's, you end up making like lifelong friends, you know? So, uh, yeah, it was really, really cool. Right on. So do you think that was the, the catalyst? Cause you've been on quite the journey since then, because, uh, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse that your, you know, your first album kingdom, uh, kingdom of the sun came out March of this year when the world decided to implode and have an apocalypse because it's been a, a long journey. Cause I'm, I say a, a blessing or a curse because I'm assuming you were going to go out on tour However, everyone's at home right now and looking for things to do and discovering new music is, is one of that. So I, I guess, how are you, how are you handling the, your, you know, your first album and, <laughs> and, and your first pandemic, all of our first pandemic and, and first pandemic. Right. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been interesting, man. You know, uh, I've been, uh, I was playing in a band before this, I was playing in a band called Citizen Zero and we were on the road, like a lot you know we're so i've been gone for the you know the past few summers you know just working and playing and uh this summer was gonna be like the first time that i went out on my own with my band uh playing the new record i was definitely looking looking really looking forward to that you know because it was gonna be a totally new experience um but unfortunately you know i'm kind of in the same boat as everybody right now where you know there's no there's no live music you know in the states at all so it's been uh it's been all right man you know it's it, it's one of those things in and the music and music it's like if every day is different you know you never know what's going to come up so even though like the world's going to shut down right now um you know i'm i'm still i'm still trying to stay busy and, and stay productive you know and i've just been working from home you know like doing a lot of sessions that's what i was doing today um 
uh, doing Zooms and stuff like that, you know. So it's been all right. I mean, it's definitely a bummer. Like I'm definitely for rock and roll, man. You got to play it live. You know, you got to be you got to be playing it and out there. But uh, it's 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 all right for now. I'm definitely I'm definitely looking forward to uh, things coming back. You know, which hopefully next year we'll see. But we all yeah, hope. It's just one of those things. Yeah, yeah, I, for sure, man. I know. Uh, one thing I'm curious about, and if I ever have the uh, opportunity to interview Joe Satriani, I'll ask him the same thing. I mean, I know he's been in bands you know chicken foot and I, you said you were in a band at the time what makes you say i i want to do an instrumental album instead of being like the lead guitar player or in in a you know a band with vocals like what motivates you to do uh to do something like that like a steve Vai or a Buckethead who's just who's mainly known for the instrumental i guess what's you know what motivated you to go that route as opposed to like getting a band together um, you know, I'm, I feel really lucky because I, I, I always grew up as more of like a band type guitar player, you know, um, and like, that's what first got me into, into guitar, you know, like Van Halen, bands with singers, you know, like Van Halen, Guns N' Roses, Ozzy, stuff like that, you know, um, but, but I, well, I, after getting off the road a few years ago, I started coming up with kind of like, uh, like some new arrangements on guitar and like trying out some new techniques and stuff. And, uh, at first, like it was, it was, I was doing it just for fun, you know, to try to like come up with some new stuff to play, you know, cause I felt like I was kind of burned out on everything I was doing, you know, just for being on the road so much and all that. And, uh, so at first I started kind of just recording some demos in my, in my apartment just for fun, you know? And, uh, I kept, I, you know, one led to another, led to another. And it's like, man, you know, I got, a, I got quite a few songs here. You know, maybe I should show them to some friends and stuff like that, you know? So I, I showed it to uh, my friend Steve uh, Lahane, who produced the album. He's like, "Man, you should record these. Like, you should really, you should really do this, you know." And uh, and my band was kind of breaking up at the time uh, as well. So it's like it kind of just uh, it was all like at the right time, and it and it just kind of lined up. And uh, I'm so I'm so proud of it. You know, it's one of those things where I wasn't sure uh, if if I could even do a whole instru uh, instrumental record, you know. And it was kind of like a learning thing, but I feel like I've learned so much from it. And I, and it, it was so much fun that, uh, I just can't wait to start working on the next one, you know? So it was cool. It was really a, uh, and it's, it's also a good time for instrumental music, you know? Um, there's a lot of, uh, kind of instrumental bands out there that are doing really well. So yeah, it's, it's been a blast, man. I, I absolutely. Cause it's, it's your own sound. It's, you're not a, um, uh... you know, you're not beholden to how your, your lead singer sounds. This is you. You know, you're able to, your creativity really has no limits and it's not dependent upon somebody else to, to mix with. I mean, maybe in the, in the future, but I mean, this is uh great to get your, you know, your name out there. Uh, if I haven't mentioned it yet, uh, Kingdom of the Sun is out already on uh candy rat, uh, yeah, candy rat records. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's really good. I know you you have a video out for cloak of light. Um, I guess I, I was reading up on your, your bio, of course, preparing for this interview, and you've already mentioned some of your influences, uh, you know, of course, Eddie Van Halen and Randy Rhodes. But I see this quote that says they were at the beginning, you know, kind of that's what got you into it. But you found your quote, like own dark and aggressive style. So I guess are there other players that motor, like, kind of influenced you to go darker, to go more aggressive? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, th I think, uh, like when I first started playing, you know, I was a really young kid. It's like, uh, Van Halen and Randy Rose are definitely like my heroes that like, made me want to pick up the guitar, you know? But, uh, I, after that, I started getting more into like some of the, some of the instrumental guys as well. Like you mentioned Steve Vai, who I love. Um, I loved Ingve a ton when I was a kid. I don't know if you're a big Ingve fan. Um, sure. but, uh, I love some of his early stuff. He's incredible. Um, and uh, that's that's what uh, for me like just learning how to play like trying to trying to play some of that stuff when I was a kid was a really big thing for me because it kind of kind of taught me how to make the guitar a voice you know that's kind of like leading into when you're doing a whole instrumental record you know you have to make it interesting with no vocals you know so that's a challenge so the guitar kind of becomes the voice that's the way I, I try to look at it you know um, but yeah other than that man like uh, there's I love so many different players you know. Um, I'm uh, a big Jimmy Page fan. Uh, I love Slash, obviously, especially like his melodic stuff. Um, I wish his soloing, I was Slash you know? would do more uh, instrumentals. He doesn't, I mean, there's one on a, a Miles record. I mean, he doesn't, and I really enjoy the Safari something. I, it's just, the name escapes me right now, but 
Uh, I got to say, and I want to ask your opinion of, of, I just mentioned it, Buckethead. Because I, while I, I always enjoyed the instrumentals, I never w- would have thought I would go to a concert or just a guy in a guitar. I just thought, I, I right. could, like an actual, I mean, I would enjoy the show, but like kind of go out of my way. But one, like Guns N' Roses had Buckethead, I, that's when I first learned of him. And that's what's like kind of blew my mind and totally changed how, the way I viewed, you know, just in, uh, being instrumental. And that's, uh, and I, he was incredible in concert. You know, he was just him and a, you know, an amp and all his weird toys and stuff. Uh, I'm, uh, I saw, I, yeah, I saw him play in Detroit a few years ago, man. It was wild. He plays just pretty much the tracks, you know, and he does all the, you know, the dancing and all that too. He's awesome, man. He's really cool. And I've watched a lot of videos of him playing with Guns N' Roses too. And that's, uh, he wails, man. He wails in that setting as well. You know, he's awesome. But you mentioned that you have like kind of a backing band. So who, who's in your band and, and I guess who, like what, you know, uh, like, well, I guess what are the instruments? Are you just, you on guitar? Is there a rhythm guitarist? Is there like who, uh, who makes up your band now? Uh, it's just a three piece. Okay. It's, uh, it's just guitar, bass and drums. Yeah. The producer and engineer, um, Steve, uh, Lahane plays bass and then, uh, uh, an amazing drummer from Detroit as well, Miguel Gutierrez plays uh, plays drums. And his dad, I guess the Detroit thing, his dad used to play for Aretha Franklin, so it's kind of oh, a cool, cool thing. Yeah, we really we rehearsed in the, in uh, his basement, which is pretty cool. But uh, yeah, it's cool, man. I've never done like the three piece. Uh, I've the bands I've been in it's usually been two guitars, you know, which is a little bit different of an approach, you know. So I kind of love when we play live, man. It's pretty cool, like uh, trying to fill up the whole sound, just guitar, bass, and drums, no vocals, you know. That's been a that's been a really cool thing. Like before, because we would play a lot of shows before uh, the pandemic, and uh, that's that's been really fun. Like trying to make a whole set interesting, with just guitar, bass, and drums, you know, um, and make it make it flow like like you're just going to see a rock band, you know. So I look forward to kind of giving back to that and exploring that more. You know, that's one thing I'm definitely missing. What's your? Do you have a personal? Because that's what I love about the instrumental. Because they're still, I'm sure, in your head kind of like lyrics to it and meaning to it, even there are no words. So is there a, uh, a, a, I want to call it, I guess a song. Is there a song on your album that means the most to you? I guess personally, maybe not, maybe not uh, technically, but as far as emotionally means the most to you? Um, yeah, I think for me, my, my, uh, my favorite on the record, Poke of Light, uh, the song you mentioned earlier, we did a video for it. Um, when I was writing a lot of this stuff, I was reading a lot of books by Ram Dass, if you ever heard of him, kind of like the 60s. Uh, he's really popular in the 60s. Okay. Um, but uh, he wrote a bunch of, he was kind of like part of like the hippie culture and all that. But he went to, he was a Harvard professor that went to India and met a, met a guru named Neem Karoli Baba. And it like totally changed his whole life. He's written a lot of books about him and stuff. And uh, I read a book of his called Be Here Now. Um, and I just kind of got really obsessed with this, this guru. Um, and I just started reading all these books about him. Um, and it was around the time I was writing the record. It was maybe a couple months before. Uh, so I actually wrote Cloak of Light as kind of like a tribute to, to him. Um, and you can actually, I sampled, there's not a lot of recordings of, uh, that particular, particular guru just because he died in the seventies, but I sampled him chanting. Uh, I just lifted it offline and, uh, we put it in the beginning of the song. So. Uh, we put it in the beginning of the and the end of the song, so it's kind of cool. Like the only voice you hear on the album is is him. Nice, but uh, that's 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 probably my favorite man, just because it's like such a personal thing, you know. But uh, yeah, that's that's the cool thing about instrumental music is even though there's no words, like to me when you play, like music still has inherent meaning, you know, whether it's a riff or a melody or whatever. Like that's a big thing with with the guitar, like and it can still have just as deep of a meaning as if you were singing lyrics. I, I totally agree. Absolutely. I mean, there are plenty of solos, uh, you know, whether it's just instrumental and instrumental song or just a solo that means more to me than more than words to kind of uh, use a, an extreme phrase, literally. There you go. <laughs> nice, <yeah. laughs> so what is your, your favorite? Can you pick one? I don't know. I don't know. Do you have like a favorite solo of all time? Because you mentioned Randy Rhodes. I, I'll never forget. Or just maybe a, a riff, if you want. If if we can, and, um, to make it uh, more of a broader question, a harder question. Because the first time I heard Crazy Train, like you, I'm like, whoa, I'm a rock fan for life. You know, that's, that's it's insane. Oh, yeah. That solo is unreal. Um, I, th- I think my favorite 
that's my favorite lead from him is probably over the mountain that's mm-hmm. on a the diver man record that solo is incredible um uh, I don't know. Favorite solo of all time is tough because there's so many great ones. You know, same thing with riff. It's like, oh my god, how I could know. you ever pick? <laughs> you know. We'll, we'll narrow um, it down. We'll narrow it down then. Since it's Appetite for Distortion, uh, what is your favorite slash solo uh, or riff? I guess which I don't know. It may not be your favorite Guns N' Roses song, you know, but it may be your favorite thing that Slash has done. You know what? My you know what is one of my favorites, and I think it's kind of underrated because. Uh, a lot of people with him, they'd say like November Rain, the solos, is un- that's unbelievable, obviously. Sure. Um, and a lot of those solos on like Appetite are incredible, but I love the solo on Don't Cry. Mm. I think that solo is unbelievable. Um, that's probably my favorite, man, especially like the music video where he walks out and just wails it, you know? <laughs> I remember watching that and being like, oh my God, it's amazing. But he's got so many great solos. Um the first song I actually ever played on stage with a band was Sweet Child of Mine. Okay, so I remember cool. like trying to figure, trying to figure out that that lead's incredible. Um, so yeah, I th- I, I got to go with Don't Cry though, man. I I, th- I just love that solo. I always have. Right on. And I know this is um, a stupid question, but even before I ask it, but that's I wouldn't be me. If you're since you're a guitar player, every time like you pass a church, do you just want to do a solo out in front of it? Like, is that just something you guys want to do? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, after, maybe if you saw, like, I remember the church in that video is like real old school, like Southern, you know, right. church. So I don't, I don't, I live in Detroit, so I don't pass too many that look like that, you know, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes when you're, yeah, sometimes you can see a scene like that, you know, if you're driving in a certain part of the country. So yeah, I would do it, man. I don't know if I could pull off a video like that. That, that takes some, you know, he's, he's a total rock star, you know, <laughs> but uh you never know, man. You never know. Yeah. I mean, you're still, I mean, I, I hate saying, I just turned 37, so it's not like you're a youngster to me, but you're still you know, very young in your career. This is your, you know, your, your debut instrumental album. Um, so I obviously your, what your, your plans were cut short. All of ours were with this pandemic. So is there anything to, you know, that you have, you're working on, uh, what's next or is it all the focus on, I guess just on this record and, and trying to maybe just have the social media approach doing zoom shows, doing web shows, like what, what's, what's to come? What's the next step right now for, for Sammy Bowler? Um, yeah, we're, I mean, I think, uh, we were supposed to kind of tour this record like all summer, you know? So I think right now it's like, we're kind of just pushing it back hopefully until next year. But, uh, I've got a, a new single coming out in November. So I'm kind of looking forward to, to that. And then, uh, yeah, I think we're going to cut, I'm going to cut another record probably uh, early next year. So hopefully when we finally do go back on the road, we'll have two records uh, to play. So that's kind of like, that's kind of the next step. But in the meantime, I've just been, I've just been, you know, hanging at home, writing stuff and just, uh, you know, posting clips online, all that. But uh, yeah, that's, those are definitely the two next things. No, awesome. Because it's great. Kingdom of, of the Sun is great. Cloak of Light uh, is great. And f- what I've heard of the of the album, I haven't listened to the whole thing yet, is just really, you know, unique. And, and just like you said, this it, there's more need for the instrumental right now because of just what you're doing. And you can t- you can t- you can put kind of put your own meaning to it uh, if as a listener, as opposed to like, OK, here are the lyrics. This is what it maybe it could mean. It's just a lot of uh, room for emotion to kind of you know, your, your, your grooves and your riffs to kind of take us along that ride. So I'm looking to see, looking forward to see what's, uh, what's next for you and, uh, just continue success, my man. I mean, this, I really appreciate the time you've given us today. Uh, thanks so much for checking out the album, man. And for having me on, it's been, uh, it's been really cool. I really appreciate it, man. Thanks so much, Sammy. Two great conversations today, Sammy Bowler, and of course the metal God himself, Rob Halford. And I got to thank, those who submit, I mean, there are a lot of questions. I always put it out there. If you have any questions you want me to ask, because I want to be your vessel to these uh, to these rock stars, because I feel lucky enough to interview them. So I want to give you an opportunity, whether it's, of course, co-hosting sometimes, but at least to get some questions in. So thank you again to uh, Gilbert Cano for the uh, wow, profound, what a profound question. That's what Rob Halford called, called your question about uh, what does he want his legacy to be. And I, I didn't know this. Uh, Nicholas uh, Florentine's question about the uh, the motorcycle rumor. I didn't know. I would not have asked that question if it wasn't for you, Nicholas. So thank you so much. So what is the come for the next episode of Appetite for Distortion? Who are we going to interview? How are you going to help me? Well, let's find out together. When? Well, 
In the words of Axel Rose concerning Chinese democracy, you'll see it. I don't know if soon is the word. Yeah! To the lame-ass security, I'm going home.